Thank you for coming. A um, little bit of physics, but this is software. A little bit of physics, light and fluffy physics, not a big deal. This is software. So what we're going to talk today about is uh, data structures, you know, state, and the mutation of state, because we're, we're playing around now with um, really impressive manufacturing tolerances on new hardware, which is directly invoking quantum effects. That's always been that way, but we're now increasingly aware of it. So here's what we're going to talk about. Quantum behavior, state, quantization, you know, how we measure whole counts, classical versus quantum physics, that's the light and fluffy bunnies in the field with flowers kind of discussion of physics, qubits, valid states, Time, time is a technology. We're actually very familiar with all this. The takeaway today is actually going to be surprisingly, quantum physics is kind of no big deal for software people because we've been doing this for a long time, our patterns, our idioms. It's weird, but it's true. Uh, everybody else has a hard time, but software, we're good to go. And then some summary observations, conclusions. So <laughs> for today, you actually know a lot of this because this is consistent with our current idioms, and I have been accused of going too fast. So interrupt, interject, throw things, feel free. But we're going to talk about quantum. At the end of today, I'm hoping everybody has a common shared understanding of quantization, measure of whole quantum. And it, it seems kind of weird at first blush, but no, no, this is intuitive. This is obvious. 150 years later, after physics kind of figured out a lot of stuff, this is already what we do. It's current practice. So we have a secondary goal of correcting some myths and stuff regarding quantum, because every time you talk about quantum computing and quantum mechanics, nobody can get a finger on what's going on. This will do that. So quantum behavior in classical systems. Classical computing, we're not authoring quantum software for quantum hardware that will come. We're talking about quantum data structures and as it applies to classical computing, classical hardware, or classical systems today. So here's a little code snippet. Uh, all this is doing is saying, is x plus 1 greater than x? Is x plus 1 greater than x? Well, yes, x plus 1 is greater than x, always. Oh, unless you're adding 1 to int max, and then it's kind of undefined, right? So this is, a, this is an example coming straight out of uh, John Regeer's presentation from CPPCon. He's talking at the end of this week on undefined behavior. But really what we're highlighting is there are two values for the same computation in the same process invocation, two values for the same computation. And now this is sitting on undefined behavior, for which C++ is famous. But that's also the idea of this superposition thing. We are simultaneously holding or representing all valid states. So here's another example. In C, a read from an uninitialized value, it can change on every read. That's allowed. And that's allowed on purpose because there's some lazy recycling of pages. There's some implementation details for why that might be so. But in the case of this loop here where we are reading continuously a value that is not initialized, that value can change during the loop. We don't know if we've been suspended and resumed. We don't know what kind of cache pressures are going on. It's an uninitialized value. That value can actually change. That is allowed in the C standard. So this is the idea that there's that integer but its value is changing even though we're not doing anything with it. It's representing more than one state. And uh, this is a recently published article talking about it. So unknowable state, state that we can't know about. We can't inspect it. It's there. So state, you know, it's, it's like a, a, a value, a representation consistent with some type. And, you know, kind of smells like an object because it is. And so it can be little, a bool, you know, a bit. It's on or off. Well, that, that's, that's kind of a small thing of state. Well, a child process, you know, we, we, we invoke those. There's a lot of state there. We've got, we've got memory and objects inside there. We've got the environment set up. There are dependencies in there. There's sort of this meta information of, uh, you know, what, it, what are the cache pressures? What are the, what are the loads on the system? How is that child process interacting with other processes? You know, kind of shared resources. There's a tremendous amount of state in there. And that's so much that usually we just say, look, um, that, that's too much state. We're just going to standard in, standard out, standard error. You know, maybe that's all we really talk about when we start playing with that child process. But there's a lot of state backing it. We're using that state. We rely upon that state. But we're only looking at the, the standard in and out streams, basically, on the child process. A lot of the state is not inspectable. Now, very big, if a child process can be big, and it is, well, what happens if you have everything on a node, a computer? 
Well, how about a whole data center? Well, how about the whole internet? How about the whole universe? How about everything? That's a lot of state. And now we're into the land of, well, is that state there? It is there. Can you use it? Well, that, that's kind of this idea of quantum interference. So you can pack as much state as you want, wherever you want, and try and isolate it as best you can. That's a kind of a hardware challenge to isolate so you don't decohere everything that's going on inside the quantum hardware. But it's ultimately an issue of we're trying to sensibly interact with state that's there and is being used, but we can't access all of it. We are relying upon it. So these are the categories. You can always get at it. You can sometimes get at it. You can never get at it. Those are categories of state. So it's interesting that this is defined by the observer. So I can access state directly, perhaps, but a different observer cannot access, access that state at all. Or maybe sometimes there are windows of access that open and close, and you have to kind of plan that. So these are the categories. It's kind of basic what you would expect for accessing anything in particular, but it's defined by the observer. And we know this today. This is how we do stuff today. So I have a global, single-threaded, non-racy, grab it, go nuts with it, mutate it, read it. It doesn't matter. Access is cheap and direct. There's no side effect. I mean, you can modify the global, but it's not, it's not, there's no data races going on here. This is, this is a pretty cheap stateful access. And I don't have to do any planning. I just use it. Indirectly accessible state. Now, there's kind of some categories of that. So sometimes it's, it's, it's costly or it's ambiguous to access the state, but maybe later on after I do a full initialization or I've secured some kind of lock or something, then I can get at it. But there's that second category where sometimes access is destructive. So we have mutating reads, you know, especially lazy compute is often a mutating read. So in that case, you can access it, but you kind of want to plan that out because access will be destructive. You're going to mutate. So in the case where you can only access it once some initialization has occurred or once you secure a lock, that's one thing. But the quantum systems are really sitting on that second one. Read is destructive. That's going to be an interesting property of quantum behavior where a destructive read is ultimately a wave function collapse where we resolve to a discrete known certain value when before it was not known, it was not certain. It had a value but we didn't yet do that destruction to collapse to a single one. And that's going to be the observer effect. That's the superposition state. We're going to use the observer effect to access to compute stuff. Inaccessible. Well, the state's there. You just can't get at it. And there are a lot of examples for why you can't get at it. There's no API. You know, there's no sensible way to get in there. But really, in C++, right, it's, it's well-defined behavior. We can reach in and grab whatever we want. But if you're reliant upon something that's not well-defined in the language, you maybe grab bits, but you have no idea what those are. They don't represent anything. So by definition, if you don't have well-defined access from some mechanism, you don't get it. It is inaccessible unless it's a well-defined access. So the object model is really, really useful for this. C++ 11 and beyond, but even C++ constructor, destructor, really useful for this. But the memory model really helps out a lot, especially in regards to you know, racy and threads. So this is a weird pattern, but this is a pattern we're familiar with. There are orthogonal concepts for whether or not the state is knowable. I know it or don't know it, versus whether it's usable. I use it or don't use it. These are orthogonal. So we rely upon a lot of state that we don't know in a child process, but we're using it. We rely upon it. And then some state, we have well-defined access. We have APIs. We, we can actually inspect it. We can know what it is. So the idea that these are orthogonal is fundamental. So it's going to be our common pattern for quantum processing. You're using the state. It exists. It's important. But you can't actually inspect it. You can't actually know what it is. You'll create them, you'll move them around, you can't look at them. So the implications are kind of severe. You are creating data structures that you are reliant upon, the state's important, but you can't look at it because it's a destructive read, which means there's no runtime classification, your conditional processing is really restricted, your debugging is going to be very limited, you can't have an inspect window, you can't look at it, it's destructive. So that's kind of a challenge, it's kind of weird, but 
that's where we're headed. Okay, so we use the state, but we can't know what it is. Quantization. Oh, counts of whole quantum, that, that's all it is. There is a case to be made that the art of software is the art of defining rules for quantization, for measuring. And that, that's actually very consistent with what we're already doing, and that's just this word quantum. We're measuring counts of whole quantum. So this is what we do all day, every day. Let's have a look. Quanta, it's plural for quantum. Quantum, the discrete resolution value. That's it. It's a whole number, usually. The quantum, it's the discrete resolution within a data structure that, that maintains your invariance. We define types. We can define whatever quantum we want. And there's some types that naturally have a quantum. Whole integers naturally have a quantum. So when we select types, everything's sitting on primitive types. You know, there's some agreement between software, the language, and hardware, what the ISO presents. There's some agreement on what these primitive data types are. And as we write software, we're continuously adding layers of rules for how to interpret and represent that value. So the way we select types, we create new data types with new rules, the way we compose types and set up new rules, all these rules are quantizations. All of them are quantizations. So int i, what's the quantum on int i? It's, a trick. it's not a true question. It, it's one, one whole integer. And, and integers are really cool because we have normalized in software, we've normalized with the hardware. Everybody agrees on whole numbers. So you can't kind of get screwed up too much because we have normalized in software, in hardware, everybody's got a mental model of the resolution with which we're working, the quantum, one, whole integers. Float. <laughs> yeah, what could it, what, what, what could be, yeah. Okay, well, it, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because we, we have this, this machine epsilon hardware limited value, but we know the quantum for floats it's not really linear over the range. It's going to be different on different hardware. And we have a lot of problems with this because we disagree on the quantum. You have to take control of that. But the problem with floats is that we have not normalized the quantum. You can do that. You add type rules on top. And that's exactly how we tame floats. Day of week. What's the quantum? It's day. Yeah. Quantum is the day. So you can, you can make whatever type you want with whatever rules you want. But when you're done, you have quantized the value to a discrete thing, a sensible thing. And that thing may be undefined, that's allowed. But the whole point of our creating types is to define rules for quantization. That's all we're doing. That's all we're ever doing. So quantization is the measure. We are constraining to a discrete set. And, and usually it's counting whole units. But we're discrete, uh, constraining to a discrete set the act of quantization is a restriction. You are always restricting to a discrete set, always. There's no, no, no caveats in that, always. And that's true in quantum physics too, which is weird. So defining a type is defining the rules, and then using the type or computing state is performing quantization. And, and whether you call it assigning or computing or measuring or whatever, you're performing quantization there. So quantum, we know about this integer thing. Integer thing's cool, everybody knows what it is, it's very simple. And if we wanna represent day of month, it's kinda like this scale, well, you know, Gregorian calendar, it's kinda like one to 31, and there might be some extra rules to make it down to 28 or something, but it kinda looks like that. The range, maybe we kinda want this zero, we'll reserve that for a trap value, why? Because I'm defining whatever rules I want. So I want a trap value. Okay, fine. Extend it down to zero. But you know what? Negative one is right out, right? <laughs> 32, no, can't have that. I'm constraining this. I'm defining new rules to quantize this value. So I probably need a whole integer unsigned, you know, within a really little range. But this on the right is actually what we have. It's not a line. It's a stair step. It's not continuous. It can't be continuous. By definition, we've agreed it's not going to be continuous. It's whole integers. So when I stair step up, I now have a range of discrete values. That's the world. And it's not the thing on the left. Don't think the thing on the left. It's the thing on the right. It's stair steps. You are allowed to have discrete values within your range, full stop. That's integers. And then that's the quantum jump. There is an atomic transitional mutation from a number 
that's discrete within my discrete range to another number that's discrete within my discrete range. I can jump from and to any numbers transactionally atomic. That's how it's going to go. That's how, you know, we kind of need this to work if it's going to be well behaved. Turns out quantum physics works exactly like this. Freaked out a lot of people in 1910. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they called it nonsense. You know, enough of this quantum jump nonsense. And well, later on, the nonsense persists. Quantum jump, it is the instantaneous, instantaneous by instantaneous, well, you know, they, we might be securing a lock or whatever in a classical machine, but no, 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 no. Quantum hardware, instantaneous, outside the bounds of time in this dimension. The instantaneous transition to a new quantum value without, without the transition through an intermediate value. So that's the whole point of an atomic mutation, but that's what a quantum jump is. I could be here, I can be here, I can jump anywhere on that line, but there's no intermediate transition through these fictional things that don't exist. That cannot happen, that never happens, it does not happen. So quantization, we have dis made discrete sets and we're jumping between the discrete sets, full stop. So a quantum data structure, quantum physics relies upon this, but a quantum data structure would rely upon this too. So the idea is I have a stateful value and I'm gonna do an atomic mutation to another stateful value. And it doesn't have to actually mean like a mutex or something. We're talking about this is a value and we jump to another value. And if, if you have rules or things that you've defined for trap values or undefined behavior, you know, that's all fine. But the whole point is we're jumping between discrete values in a range. All ranges are composed of discrete values. So integers are cool because we've normalized this. So, you know, here's kind of some some unsigned ranges and some signed ranges. And the normalization is really the value add. You know, hardware guys, software guys, everybody agrees on, you know, this has been normalized, we're good to go. Integers, not hard, whole counts, not bad. Okay, but, you know, integers are only fun, yes? Just quick, when you say normalized, are you just referring to that there's general agreement or is there some like harder Great question. So in the context of normalized, is that general agreement or is there a hard mathematical rule? Uh, general agreement, uh, because integer is a whole number count and everyone has an unambiguous understanding of a whole number count. In the land of quantum physics, it is literally a whole number count for photons, whole number count for energy, whole number count for mass, whole number count for spin, orbital spin, whole number count for everything. So it'll be whole counts. In software, we like to make things confusing because we have floats. <laughs> so whole counts are too big. We want little, little, little things are good. And you know, atoms get little, so we can get little too. So if whole numbers are too coarse, we'll go to floating point. And now we got our little line from some min to max, and the question goes back to, well, what's the quantum? It's variable. It's variable. <laughs> it depends. You know, it, 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 there's no good answer to this. You have to put rules on top of it to get an answer because there is no good answer because of the hardware representation or what we assume in software or, you know, we do have the standard numeric limits float, you know, double colon epsilon. Epsilon is merely the delta from 1.0 to the next larger representable value. So it, it, it's, it's a metric, it's, it's a quantum, but it's not, you know, constant over that range. And Fundamentally, that just means we have different quantum if you're storing, you know, zero to one, negative one to positive one, negative to positive two million, billion, you know, negative positive infinity. Your quantum is all over the place. We've not, we don't have any shared agreement on what it means. So you have to apply rules to fix that, and then, and then we do. But ultimately, this resolution limit, it always exists. There is a bit pattern here. So the continuous range is not a real thing. There is no real thing, not even for floats. It is a stair step, just like integers. It is a stair step. Now, in, in the case of floats, that stair step is not, not linear distribution. You know, that's a little weird, but that's the, the quantum problem. But it's a stair step. So if you jump atomically from one value to another value, there are a lot of values to pick from, that's gonna be your quantum jump for float. And the resolution limit exists. There's a bit pattern that we recognize. Now, we, we've got some, you know, eight million trap values for weird things and floats. So you might have to do some rules around funny illegal bit patterns, but it is discrete, it's resolvable. We can measure the resolution at which a float can approximate what we need. It is a stair step. 
well, okay, I know how I'll fix this. I'll double down and go for a bigger float. <laughs> yeah. That's well, not, yeah, that's not gonna fix anything. You, now you got more range, you know, you can do better approximations, but you don't solve any problems by going to bigger floats. You have the same stair step, it just is. It's a bit pattern, discreetly resolvable, maybe some rules for trap values and based on how it's represented in your hardware or whatever language guarantees there are for resolution, but a range, any range of any kind, is sitting on discrete values within that range, full stop. There are no continuous values in that range. It's important for software, that's how the physics works, and that's what blew their minds in 1900. Takeaway, a range of continuous values does not exist, has never been shown to exist, cannot exist, and when you go into the quantum universe, the rules of nature, you know, of everything, that's not true. Oh, but the bottom one is true. A range of discrete values does exist. Well, we have floats, we have ints, they work. We kind of have agreement on them. So all ranges are composed of discrete values. This is why quantum computing is like no big deal for software, blows the minds of a lot of other people. But we deal with floats, we've suffered for decades, that's like pre-training. You know, you're, <laughs> you're on board, you're ready to go. Data objects are always quantized, especially in a classical system, because you're sitting on discrete bit patterns, right? You know, there's a representable set of state that, that we've bounded, that's represented in a well-defined way in our classical systems. So the value is always gonna be discrete. Now you can have rules, you know, whatever rules you want for undefined or how you're going to say these, these within this range are kind of roughly equivalent to something else. So you can come up with arbitrary rules, but these rules just give you an illusion of continuous. So kind of like type punning, where you're kind of cheating a little bit, we can do this illusion where I can fiddle with the resolution and I can fiddle with the clock and I can approximate a continuous range. But in reality, continuous ranges do not exist, not in software, not in physics. Because the natural world is quantum. It's high resolution, but it's not continuous. Weird. Analog and digital. So, you know, we all know this. There's a big cut over from vinyl to digital. Now it's coming back to vinyl a little bit. You know, we all do a little digital oscilloscope stuff in the lab, and digital is a discrete set of values, right? We've, we've quantized the values that came from some analog signal. So we have digitized our analog value, and the analog kind of looks like a continuous range. It's a sine wave, or, or whatever it is. Yeah, but a continuous range does not actually exist. You can approximate it, but it doesn't exist, not even in the real world. So, when you measure using analog, we, we are able to actually measure the resolution. I mean, you just need a measurement that, that's effective, right? So if you're doing chemical, um, chemical development of film, you know, there's a resolution. We kind of know what that is. And when you're doing digital capture through a CCD array or something of your image, there's a resolution. We kind of know what that is. The resolutions are on both of them. And it's just that, well, like chemical developing a film is sort of using what we've, we've historically called analog processes. We're using chemistry, using quantum universe, natural world stuff, and running at pretty high uh, resolution for the most part. And we are adapting that to what we're able to measure. And, and you know, we used to not measure very well. Now we can measure individual, individual photons, no problem. You know, single particles, size of an atom or smaller, no problem. You know, we, we have really impressive manufacturing tolerance, so we can see this stuff now. And that's the dropping of the new hardware. That's why we're reliant upon this. But a limit always exists. There is always a resolution limit. If you can't see the resolution limit, well, you just don't have a good enough measuring mechanism. But we have really good measuring mechanisms. And we're talking about describing anything. It's not continuous. It's discrete values, maybe a lot of them, within a range. Physics, light and fluffy, bunnies in the field, not hard to do. 120 years ago, you guys know all this stuff now, it's like common parlance, but classical physics assumed it was a continuous range. That's not true. It's how silly would you think that now? We'll talk about why in a second. But when you recognize that values within the range are discrete, you're now doing quantum physics. So there was this transition where we now have a new way to do physics, assuming or understanding or measuring or observing or somehow experimenting with how do we resolve these discrete values that are observed within the range. And the range is gonna be the range of all things presented by nature, all things in the real world. So classical is that line, 
quantum is the stair step. We already do the stair step even for floats. This is the hero of the story. There's a few big names in here coming up, but the hero is this person. So Max Carl Ernst Ludwig Planck. <laughs> he was playing around with light bulbs. He's you know, teaching and doing other stuff over in Germany. This is Thomas Edison and you know, Nikola Tesla time playing with light bulbs. And he's been charged with build a better light bulb. That'd be great. And well, you know, light bulbs, a perfect light bulb would be like this perfect emitter of light. So the opposite of that, because we're physics, we'll do the opposite first. The opposite of that would be a black body. A black body would be the perfect absorber of light. So he's playing around with black body radiation and none of the math is working out. Years going into this, smart guy, very despondent, it's not going well. And after, after all this sadness, he kindly you know, punts. We'll, we'll publish now, fix it later. I'm gonna introduce a constant. And the constant is the Planck constant. And the Planck constant says, this is it's a little number. This little number is my unit, and everything else is based on that unit. And now we publish and you know, rah, rah. There's a lot of debate over this, but this is the idea that energy exists only in quantized form. Later on, we'll call that a photon. But this, this quantized form is all that exists. You don't have half of it. You don't have a quarter of it. You have one or zero. And if you want more than one, you can have more than one but not, not fractional counts, whole numbers of that constant. So that was like totally weird, out of the blue, totally consistent with how we resolve integers and floats. So he was very embarrassed about this up front, and he did publish, and he got a Nobel Prize for it in 1905 after the work done in 1900. And because it's energy equals HF. HF, um, H is the Planck constant, so that little number, times frequency, that's the energy in your little bundle. Today we call HF a photon. And Einstein starts playing around with it, other people start playing around, and nobody believed it, this is crazy, that's that quantum jump nonsense, you know, whole counts of quantum, silly ridiculous. But prior to that, we assumed it was a continuous range because the resolution was so good that we couldn't observe discrete values. We just assumed it was continuous. Now after this, we got a constant, it's stair-stepping. And this changed physics, fast forward to today, this is 120 years ago. So, Energy exists in discrete packets, today we call them photons. Modern C++, it's kind of like before and after C++ 11. Physics is before and after quantum mechanics. It's, it's really it. So quantum mechanics is everything after the quantization of discrete bundles of energy. That's it. And there's more math there, so we have more to do. Here's a guy, did a thing, uh, Nobel Prize in 21, but the photoelectric effect. It's not continuous. An electron will dislodge, or a, a photon will dislodge an electron or not. And there's this work function denoted by that funny squiggle there. This is where it gets very interesting because if you're double E, for example, you got all this noise and thermal and whatever happened in the manufacturing fab plant, and I want a clean signal out. What do I have to buy? You know, what kind of serviceable parts do I need to maintain? You know, what kind of peak sample hold algorithm do I have to employ to get a clean signal out from all this noise in? Oh, like nothing. The work function is for free. You are dislodging electrons or not through discrete interactions of photons and electrons. That's what's going on here. So you do dislodge or don't dislodge electrons based on discrete interactions. The work function, that's the basis of everything, we'll talk about that in a second. This is the opposite of that. First winner of the Nobel Prize, Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen. If you bang two particles together really hard, you either do get x-rays or you don't. That's it. You know, do like half an x-ray? No, you don't get half an x-ray. So banging particles together emits photons. Well, that's cool. So you have discrete interactions. Niels Bohr. Atomic model. This is kind of what we're sitting on. Here's that delta E equals HF. You know, I will emit a photon if I drop an electron to a lower orbital. Or not. If I don't drop, I don't emit a photon. But if I do drop, I do emit a photon. And the reverse. I can give an electron a photon and it'll pop to an outer orbital or it won't. And different orbitals are different for the different atoms. The energy required, the work function is different. But we are quantizing the movement of electrons across these orbitals. 
So not continuous, electrons exist in discrete orbitals. They can't just be wherever they want. They kind of can, but no, they're in discrete orbitals. Carl's Mane Sigbon, Nobel Prize 24, not continuous. An electron will drop to a lower orbital or not. Building on Bohr's work, he quantified it. So we now have spectro spectroscopy and all these little things where we can measure elements from the other end of the universe by looking at these little discrete values in our you know, chromographic scale of what things are present or not present. It's discrete because electrons are slopping around orbitals, they're measurable, they're discrete values that we understand, build up a database of what all these things are, that's what he did. A lot of tedious work in the lab from poor little grad students, and there we have it. You know, now we're, now we're good to go. But it's discrete. We have these discrete signature values for these atomic and molecular combinations because they exist, electrons do, in discrete orbitals interacting with photons. Compton scattering, Arthur Holly Compton, not continuous. Light will interact with, uh, well, particles in this case, but what's interesting is that interaction is dual nature. It was well established that, well, you know, we all know energy is a wave, but he's saying, well, but it's a particle too. This is that wave-particle duality thing. Fast forward a little bit, we find out wave-particle duality is everywhere. But this was sensational at the time to say, light really is a wave, and it is. And light really is a particle, and it is. And the, the weird thing of this duality is, when I say it is and it is, it is. It's not that it behaves like, that it's, that it's a metaphor for, no, no, it is one of those things, but it cannot be both at the same time. That's weird, kind of blows some minds, but this wave-particle duality kind of made everybody you know, scratch their heads saying, how can it behave as one of either of these things, but not at the same time? But there it is, we start playing around and it's fun. And then we go on to De Broglie. So Louis de Broglie. This starts to get interesting because we, we, are, we are working with wave functions now. So I can guide particles with a wave function that guides them. And I can have a wave function guiding a particle, but I can have a particle of arbitrary mass and guide it with a wave function too. And so basically what he's saying is a couple of things. There is this internal clock independent of time by which I can calculate stuff, and mass is not constant. The true mass is not constant. All matter exhibits wave-like behavior. But ultimately, all this exists within the quantization, the quantized universe, because we have discrete interactions of energy and particles. So Werner Carl Heisenberg, quantum jumps. Quantum jumps occur, or they do not. When we compute values, we reduce things to a state, a certain state, but there's an element of probability with that. So this is where matrix math came in before it was pure mathematics. Now it comes into physics. So the idea of matrix math, you know, big thing of numbers, a lot of operands there, big thing of numbers, a lot of operands there. You do something to them, discard the operands. That's, that's lossy, right, if it's a mutation. We compute a value, but we discard the operands. So this is going to be our mutating lazy read, basically. And so matrix math wave function collapse. When we measure, we're going to trigger a mutation. We're going to trigger a, a physics effect. We're going to lock to a certain value an element that exists in the real world, a physics thing. And so waveform collapse is kind of how things work. Matrix math, it's interesting, but that's the uncertainty principle. Erwin Rudolf Josef Alexander Schrodinger. So he, he was the father of quantum mechanics, later came on to say, you know, I regret a lot of that stuff. It was really hard and it blew my mind. But measurements are discrete, they really are. When you get a bull, it's gonna drop to a true or false. It's not like half of one or the other. You're gonna get a true or false, it's just the way it is. But there's an uncertainty associated with the value you got. You did get a true, but there's an uncertain component of that true. So this is the Schrodinger thing where we're now moving to complex numbers. So to real numbers times square root of negative one, complex numbers, talk about them in a second. But this shift to complex numbers handles pretty well these problems that we have where doggone it, this other junk in other dimensions keeps messing with us in this dimension. And that's where the negative numbers come in. Turns out that's a real thing. So 
we have probability associated with anything we do, but we can drop to a discrete state. We just have to get comfortable with the probability problem. Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac, last guy. Einstein has been uh, long, long revered as what God's greatest gift to cartoonists because, you know, the hair, larger than life, whatever, you know, and so he's, he's part of our lexicon today. If, if he wasn't around, it would be this guy. So he, doing math with his Dirac equation thing, discovered this antimatter thing. These antimatter anti particles mirror matter, matter particles. There, there's like a correlation there. And they're discrete. You get a matter particle, well, there's a correlated antimatter particle. And be, based on math, well, well, it says here that there should be like anti-electrons out there. And well, let, let's go find them. Later on, we find them. We can make antimatter. That's cool. So it's very expensive, turns out, if you want to buy some <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> but Feynman and Stuckelberg separately, they propose that anti-electrons are electrons moving back in time. We'll play with time in a second. But antimatter exists. We know that to be true today. And this, this discovery of this, this whole other universe of anti to go with this universe of matter, that was kind of the world of him. And um, Einstein says he really skirted that boundary of genius and madness. That's why he would be a great cartoon character. So indivisible, quantum, you have a photon, HF, and you, it's your photon or you don't have it. You either have it or you don't. It's not like half of one. You can't have half of one. It cannot be subdivided. There is this Planck's constant thing going on, but we kind of know this wave particle duality now, which we now know applies to pretty much everything because mass is arbitrary. There is no true mass of anything. It's variable. Energy is discrete. We know that to be true. And energy interactions are discrete. We know that to be true. And these discrete interactions make up the stair step. The stair step of float, the stair step of int, stair step of class date, stair step of whatever data type you want to make. So we have an epsilon in physics, quantum physics. We also have an epsilon in everything we do in software. And, and well, from physics standpoint, well, why is it discrete? Why is it a stair step? This is why, because it's a standing wave. A standing wave, you have a standing wave or you do not. There's no halfway, there's no part of one. You can play with the frequency if you want, but you either do or don't have a standing wave. And everything is made up basically of this. So, you know, we know that this table is not solid because it's made up of atoms, and we know atoms are empty space. And well, atoms being empty space, they're all actually just little bitty standing waves, you know, playing around with each other, interacting in discrete ways. So there are a lot of standing waves. We play with them. They're very useful to understand. But a particle is a standing wave with itself, with a node and anti-node. And entanglement is multiple particles participating within, within an overarching standing wave. That's how you entangle something. So if you want to entangle multiple things mathematically in a wave, or in physics in a wave, that's how you're going to start doing weird cross coherence between things. And when we decohere, we measure. So here's some examples of that. The Russians are doing some really neat work on this. This is Russians up in the Russian space station. Well, everybody's space station. There's a space station up there. So uh, that, that's a little video there saying this is a mathematical description of a particle standing wave. You know, it just goes around and, and draws out the little particle standing wave. You can mathematically describe it. But this is an experiment on the station. So that little thing, you can't maybe see it here, but go, go watch the video. It's kind of cool. It's a, it's a T. It's a hunk of metal. There are no moving parts in that thing. And he spins it. And it spins, it traces that thing over, gets unstable, and it flips. And it spins, traces it, and it flips. So this is a, a, a real-world version of mathematically drawing a particle, standing wave. So that's it. That's the universe. That's everything. There's no solid anything. They're all standing waves. What's quantized? Everything's quantized because everything's a stair step. Everything in the natural world, energy, mass, angular momentum, pick a metric, it's quantized. There's a discrete resolution, always. And computers, well, they physically exist, so you know, everything in there is quantized. But a continuous measure doesn't exist. Everything's stair-step. Everything is broken down into discrete values within a quantized range, always. So this illusion of continuous, you know, we have analog oscilloscopes. We have things that are running at a high clock, and it sure looks continuous. You can always present continuous. You play games with the clock, or you play games with the resolution that you're measuring, and you can present a continuous value. Now that our manufacturing science is really good, we, we can visually me physically measure these discrete things. So the natural world. The natural world is actually high resolution. It's quantized 
high resolution. So everything being digital, which is kind of what that's saying, kind of weird, the world is digital, um, we're modeling hardware. We have mechanical machines to do math or software or whatever it is we do. And we have some higher order manipulation to do FPGA or you know, GPU or whatever it is we want to do. We have electronic ways. So you know, whether it's solid state or not in how we want to compute things, we're doing this based on values in a discrete range, always, or discrete values within a range. And all we're doing is when the hardware drops with the new instruction set architecture, we address it with software. We come up with these, these fictional constructions of our software design that we overlay on the hardware, and somehow that models and gets us an answer that we like. All of that is ultimately going to be based on quantum effects, especially with today's tolerances, and discrete values within the range. And we define the rules. It's a lot of work to define the rules. There's a lot of ambiguity in some cases, but the ultraviolet catastrophe, that was the black body radiation that started Ma uh, uh, Max Planck on the road here, saying that I need a constant to show it's not, a, it's not a continuous set of values within the range. Mathematically, physics, you can still do Newtonian physics. There's nothing wrong with dropping apples and measuring stuff. I mean, that, that works. Lots of classrooms do that all over the world. But when you get down to either small things that are hard to observe at the edges of what we're able to measure, or even big things. You can have big quantum effects. It's ultimately based on discrete values in a range and these games that we're playing here. So we have to model the hardware. The hardware is sitting on quantum physics, not classical physics. It's just not. So this is, this is actually the important takeaway. And this is intuitively why you kind of know this world to be true. You know, we have atoms. We have little photons running around. And they interact. And we measure them. And we gave out a whole bunch of Nobel Prizes in 19, 1900. And that's because of this. Energy interactions are discrete with that wave function. And that wave function is what we're using. You either get an interaction or you do not get an interaction. That's the basis of all the quantum hardware. And, and you can get that interaction in a zillion different ways, which is why everybody's screwing around trying to build weird quantum hardware to do weird things. But you can measure it any way you want. So that's the, the big off to the races to figure out how to measure something in a stable way where you can basically play with these interactions. So everything's really these little, little standing waveforms. They're interacting with each other. Classical, that continuous range doesn't exist. Quantum, stair step, yep, that, that exists. And cold to hot, or, or dim to bright, or light to heavy, that's, that's all the stair step thing. But notice that's both mass and energy, because they're perfectly convertible, and because the only thing that actually exists is waveforms, which we usually see as energy. But you can't actually present it as mass. That's kind of cool. But um, this whole idea that things aren't constant and they are convertible, you know, especially as you start playing electron and anti-electron, and we're physically doing that. I mean, we build this stuff and we get them to collide because, you know, it's fun. Everything is sitting on quantized values. That's it. That, that's all the hardware is doing, and that's all the new hardware is doing too. It's all the old hardware did too, except we couldn't really see the resolution of it so well. Now we have good resolution. So this just says. That's how everything works. You know, when you say, well, what's using quantum physics? Uh, everything. I mean, the Newtonian world exists, but ultimately it's underscored by quantum phenomenon. And depending on the resolution, you're stepping in quantum phenomenon quite a lot because this is the laws of nature. This, this upholds. This is mathematically predictable and usable in construction, whatever. So done with physics, no more of that. Yeah, who needs physics? Valid states. What's the radix? This is a personal pet peeve. I'm run record. I, I have a bias. I'm not partial to bivalent logic. It, it happens to be out there. But at the lowest level, a bit is a fiction. It doesn't exist. There is a range that we would read as false. There's a range that we would read as true on something out there, maybe a wire. But there's that honking big gap in the middle where I don't really know if it's false or true. So even in the hardware, no one's ever going to say it's really just false or true. That's not true. That's a lie. There's a big honking, I don't know, in the middle. And now we smooth that over because the if statement is useful. And the ISIS kind of do enough error correction that I'm pretty sure it's true. No, no, I'm sure it's true. You know, the hardware's lying to you all the time. So you can pick whatever radix you want. For a lot of reasons, we pick binary. But when you go ternary or above, 
You're in the land of, not bivalent, but multi-valued logic. And that solves a lot of problems. It handles a lot of ambiguity. Um, you know, it's not to talk about that today, but if you pick anything that's not binary, you're multi-valued logic. And the assertion is that, you know, the hardware is not binary, but the smallest thing in the universe that could possibly exist is a bit that's true or false, plus an attribute of unknown. That's the smallest thing. You need three states to measure that or to represent that, or to model that, or to use it productively. So anyway, we're Radix 2. So since we're Radix 2, and we are, well, that, that's classical hardware. Yeah, but that's the quantum hardware too. Most quantum hardware is Radix 2. Some places like, you know, University of Queensland, Australia, they're playing around with, with ternary or other Radixes, but everybody's Radix 2. Let's pretend Radix 2 for now because that's kind of what we got. Radix 2. So if I had, well, I don't know, a bit, and it's radix 2, well, what are the possible values for radix 2? Trick question, you're all like programmers and stuff. Yeah, we all well, know, 0 and 1, you know, it's, it can't be both, it's gonna be one or the other. If I were to read the value, it's going to be one or the other, it's not like halfway, it's always quantized, you can't have half a value. It's gonna be one of those two values within my legal radix. Radix defines discrete values. Well, the, the quantum thing is, you know, we know in discrete classical bivalent logic, it's going to be zero or one. Well, this quantum thing is kind of like saying, hey, it's like superpositioned. We know we can be zero and one. You know, that's kind of the idea there. Now, literally, it's not zero and one. That's the next slide. But a qubit is a complex linear combination of a zero state and a one state. So that's going to be an important point. We'll talk about it in a second because that's the unknown. That's the generalization of probability. So superposition, we have here under quantum the idea that we can start interfering values and having superposition values that we measure, we collapse waveforms later. So that's the discrete versus superposition. And then this is, this is one of the things that, that some people are um, very feisty about, where a qubit is not zero and one. A qubit is a complex linear combination of a zero state and a one state. So it's also, the second definition, an ontological category, a qubit is. A qubit is an ontological category. It's a way of classifying things. There's no corollary there with our classical systems, so that's gonna be an issue. We're gonna start doing and thinking about things where we don't have a classical corollary. That's gonna be the superposition thing. It doesn't map directly to anything classical. But quantum mechanics is a generalization of probability because ultimately we're taking a value, true or false, it's gonna be one of those, but you know, I'm gonna apply this complex kind of idea to that value. There's, there's sort of this unknown attribute, and when I resolve it, it will be true or false. But until then, there's a lot of state inside that float times float times the square root of negative one that we're going to use. But this is going to give us probability amplitudes, positive or negative, and now our numbers are complex, meaning they're not real numbers, they're complex numbers, they're imaginary numbers. A qubit, this is kind of like what a qubit would look like. Not exactly, this is an incomplete example, but it's kind of like what a qubit is. If I were to create a qubit, oh, oh, no, I have to point out, if you are in that category where people question your ability to know what a monad is, we now know to just say in open conversation, well, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors, and then everyone will now know you do actually know what a monad <laughs> is. The physicists, they have a similar issue. And if you don't know what a qubit is, it's a bit with a complex number on it. Well, no, 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 no. Do you know what a qubit is? Oh, yes, well, a qubit is just a unit vector in two-dimensional Hilbert space. Oh, okay, now you know what a qubit is. <laughs> so if ever there were doubts, we're good to go. So we are physicists now. <laughs> a qubit's kind of like this. It's a bool, but we've applied this complex number. It's the complex number, it's this a plus b, those are real numbers, times the square root of negative one. And now that makes it an imaginary number, you know, i is an imaginary number, and, and the, reason it's, the reason it's imaginary is because no self-respecting real number would satisfy that equation. So, now we're in the land of imaginary, which is weird. There's apparently a mathematical reason for it. There is, because we've got this antimatter thing going on. But I have a bool, and I have a complex number that's applied to that bool, and I have a mutating destructive read. So when I do a dot get or a dot value in this case, 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my bool, I will apply the complex number to it, I will somehow force it back to a bool to a certain value. It's going to be radix 2, it's got to be 1 or 0. But that action there, after I do that, I'm going to drop my coherence with some associated payload. I'll decohere, and that is a mutation. It's a black box, irreversible operation. So this is our, we're using the value, but once you read it, it's pinned. You've mutated it. And that's going to be our standard data structure. Now, in the case of entanglement, we'll talk more about it in a second, but the example is incomplete because if this object is entangled with a bunch of other objects, you don't decohere yourself, you decohere everybody. You've got to reach inside yourself, find everybody to which you're coupled, decohere them, resolve them to a fixed value. And that's the leakage of information that exists in the land of physics. Now, this is how we would model it in software. The computational density goes way up, as you can see. Because all these data structures, they're invasive. They're invasive. And every read now is mutating this, and it's mutating all those other data structures that are in coherence with this one. So this is how we would model it in a classical system. But read is a mutating, lazy compute. That's it. It's irre irreversible, destructive. When we go to the hardware, it's going to be that a lot. Now, now we, we we're kind of aware of this mutating, lazy you know, compute thing. And we got other functional languages like Haskell that just don't want to mutate. They'll just do lazy computation or whatever. But the physicists kind of figured out, you know, terminology gets to be really important because I, I have this qubit here. And, and it's going to be in one of two kind of scenarios. The first scenario is, no, no, I pinned it. I looked at it. I did the destructive read. And it's pinned to a certain value. That's the eigenstate. But before I did that, it's not yet pinned to a certain value. It has a certain value. It is true or false, but I didn't pin it yet. That's the, that's the superposition state. And the physicists have terms for this. The eigenstate is the certain value. It is pinned. The eigenvalue is the uncertain value. It's the quantum value. It's the superposition value. It is a definite value, but it's not yet been made certain. So the act of measurement, the act of observation, the act of the destructive read, that's going to pin it. So eigenvalues become pinned as soon as you observe them. So in the land of physics, this is the terms to disambiguate. I have an object, and it existed in an eigenvalue for a while. And then I did the read. Now it exists in an eigenstate for a while. And then it gets dead. And or you can re-entangle it. You can go nuts. <laughs> so eigenstate, eigenvalue. This is the terminology thing that might be helpful for us to kind of disambiguate these scenarios of where in the life cycle might you be. So the wave function collapse. I talked about it a little few times. But it's a mutation to replace a, an uncertain value with a certain one. After I observe the qubit, it is true or false. It's not like halfway, it can't be that. But the wave function collapse, the act of observation, the act of pinning it, the act of dropping it to an eigenstate, that's going to be the essence of measurement in our quantum system. So if you're starting to play around with some of the new APIs for the quantum hardware, you're going to do all this work to set everything up, and then you're going to look at it, and that's it. And you know, that's kind of the life cycle of computation in a quantum system. So the wave function collapse, it's our measurement. But it's, it's a black box for irreversible mutation. You can't go back. No going back. If you view it in the debugger window, you hosed everything for everybody else down the line. So the wave function mathematically superimposes several eigenstates. And we define rules for that. We define our types. And the collapse just uh, reduces it to a certain state. So this is the same code you just saw a second ago. But you know, we talked about being mutating. It is mutating. We, we assign a certain value to the bool. And we decohere. We drop our entanglement after we've mutated all the people to which we were entangled. So it's a mutation. Wave function collapse is just a mutation. This is why it's not functional. It's not functional programming. It can't be functional programming. Turns out this is you and your life and you know, everything you look at, everything you see, everywhere you go, everything hitting everything in the real world. They're doing this wave function collapse all the time. There are mutations all the time. There's no functional pure thing going on at all in the coherence, decoherence of this messy, messy quantum universe. This is a really good overview. It is a, what do they call it? It is a um, graphic novel with nonlinear storytelling fashion to convey 
quantum physics. This is between mom and a daughter, or mom and a son. And you know, go, go check out the link because it's a lot bigger. I just pull out this one little section. And the, the takeaways here are we do interference to you know, kind of hook stuff together. We do wave function collapse. That's how we're going to measure stuff. And the amplitudes, complex numbers, remember square root of negative one. We can start to phase in and out these values and we can cause them to interfere with each other such that some interactions occur and some don't occur. And that's really what's going on in quantum hardware. It's not running everything in parallel. It is causing setups to occur by which values are read out where we have a high confidence that the signal is coherent. The signal approximates the desired value. So this is different from generalized probability in that we have complex numbers, square root of negative one. But it's a choreographing of what we do in our coupling and cohering things together followed by a measurement. That choreographing is writing software for quantum hardware. We emulate it if we're doing it for a classical machine, but that's very tedious. But the, the strategy is this. You define your data structures with some knowledge of the algorithm, and you want to set things up such that the, the values you like, they're in phase with each other, and they're you know, maximizing amplitude with each other. And the values you don't want, we're going to choreograph it so that they're out of phase with each other, and that we lower them in probability. And when we say, observe, and at that point we get a value in, I think it's the value, because it's a generalization of probability. There's an element of uncertainty. So that's our data structure strategy if you're dealing with quantum hardware, but you can emulate that in software. So reading a value. If I were to read, well, I don't know, UN32, how many states might I possibly read? You know, you all know, you know, 4 billion, 2 to 32, right? We're radix 2. So no, no, but now it's going to be a quantum 32-bit value. So a quantum 32-bit value, if I were to read it, how many values might I observe? Yeah, it's radix 2. You know, you're not going to get more values. It's still radix 2. So your range is the same because you're still sitting on qubits, bits. They have, until you measure them, they're whatever they are, but they're still just bits. So you're radix 2. You're going to read the same value set. So this is what's different. If I have one UN32, well, I'm going to only have one of those values. But if I have one Q, quantum, quantum bit association of 32-bit values that I'm going to do some math on to approximate some number, I can represent all of them because each of the 32 bits is a complex linear combination of a zero state and a one state. And that's how I can approximate the whole thing. And then as our algorithms get applied, this will go like a topographic map. Some things will go down in priority, some things will go up in priority. And when we read a value, we're hoping to get the most likely value out. That, that's it. But notice the, the payload requirements. This only requires one integer to model the whole space. So that means memory requirements are different, and they are. So if you want to model a 32-bit space, you only need 32 qubits. That, that's kind of cool. Unless you have a classical machine, then you need like 43 gig, which is more. <laughs> and so the memory requirements are kind of fundamentally different, but we're just talking about modifying the data structure space. So notice our data structure over here, 32 bits. It's like, it's like this big. It's not very big at all. Yeah. Check out the computational density inside that thing. That's going to be the challenge we have, the computational density by which we manipulate and play with these data structures and then the algorithms that allow them to do that mutation to raise in probability the value we want to read. Quantum supremacy. So Google says, eh, about 50 bits, somewhere around there. And it's when a quantum machine can outperform a classical machine. So if I have 50 qubits, if I have like a 2 to the 50, then that's better than a classical machine because classical would be like 9 petabytes. And you know nobody's got laptops like that right now. So the idea of a 50 qubit value, it's only going to give you 2 to the 50 in your value range. So as long as your computed answer fits in there, you're good. And if your answer is 42, it fits in there. <laughs> so you know not every problem can be solved that way. 
but a lot of them can. So you're not, you're not giving yourself more values out. You're just increasing the computational density of the very small set of bits that you're playing with. So around 50 bits was kind of the goal. We're kind of hitting that this year. And then D-Wave and other hardware, they got hundreds of qubits here and there. And you know, it's not all, not everything's equal because of the way they're doing decoherence and addressing the algorithm. Talk about that you know, a little bit later maybe, but um, you're just talking about reading a two to the 50 if you have a 50-bit quantum computer. So practically, yeah, yeah, 50 qubits may outperform for some problems, a classical machine. But practically, we're talking about the scale is going to be different. Our memory requirements are going to be different. Our alg algorithmic approach is going to be different. The computational density inside our data structures, it's going to be a lot higher. Our algorithms manipulating that, it's going to be a lot more interesting because you can't look at it. You can interfere with it, but you can't look at it. Not until you measure, not until you decohere and collapse. So you're going to need to discover an algorithm and run it with some probability, some confidence level that your value resulting in a good value is something you can live with, you can trust, and you're willing to spend a billion dollars on a new fab plant or something. But inefficiencies can be on the classical side or the quantum side, depending on your problem, depending on your approach. So that's why you know, classical is not going away. It's still going to be around for a lot of things. If quantum kind of gets commoditized, it's only going to work for some stuff, probably not all stuff. Probably never all stuff, who knows. There is a practical limit, and this is kind of a fun slide, but you know, just food for thought, how big can your binary executable get? I mean, there's a point at which you're going to have to partition across nodes and whatever, and oh, it can be infinitely big. Oh, that's not true. I mean, you know, your cache is always going to be cold. How are you going to load that thing? You can't have an infinitely big executable. You can't. Well, how big can your data set get? Infinitely, you're not going to have an infinitely big data set. You know, how do you do track? You're going to have to partition it, then you have to do transactional updates. You know, it gets to be a disaster. This is not going to scale linearly to infinity. You can't have that. Well, quantum kind of bypasses this von Neumann architecture thing. So we now have a strategy, a way to start talking about really big scale stuff. And this is why there's so much commercial and state actor interest in it. And Retired instruction count is largely irrelevant. Our strategies are totally different when you do quantum software on quantum hardware. But quantum software on, on classical hardware is easy. You just have, well, easy. Your computational density inside the data structure goes way high. A lot of issues, a lot of red up there. The hardware is hard to build, tricky. The software is hard to build, tricky. The hardware is dealing with a lot of effects we don't fully understand and we're having a hard time measuring. We can measure a lot of times in a lot of cases, generalization of probability, that doggone observer effect just kicks into gear at the weirdest times. And now we, we do have sort of this, this new techniques where you can't look at it. You can play with it, you're using the data, you're entangling, don't look at it until you trigger the wave function collapse. It's kind of fundamental to the quantum hardware. But in a classical system, that's actually a very useful mechanism by which everybody's setting in. And it's kind of like if you're doing like a, like a, like a bidding auction thing. You know, everybody's piling on and entangling. And at the last second at the deadline, you trigger the wave function collapse. Everybody got factored into the total. This is a classically useful, classical algorithm applicable type of approach. But the computational density inside the data structure goes way high, not for the faint of heart. So quantum, quantum isn't quantum, it's multidimensional. That's all, really. So anything, anytime weird things are happening, just blame the thing in the other dimension that's messing with you here, because the hardware guys do. And literally, actually, for really, we're, we're doing that. We're offloading to other dimensions, processing where the time constraints are different from what we got in this dimension. So, we, we know more dimensions exist. We have hardware and quantum effects to do weird things. You know, we got all these weird w approaches to do, you know, string theory or whatever crazy stuff we're doing. But ultimately, we're talking about there's information in the other dimensions that we're using that is entangled with this dimension. When we trigger wave function collapse, we are incorporating it in the into the computed value. That, that's all that's going on. That's how 32 qubits are actually able to represent the whole state space. But it's not a panacea. It's not infinitely fast. So we, right now we're decohering like, like really fast, you know, nanoseconds or maybe microseconds. I mean, the stuff decoheres really fast. So it's hard to do hardware like this 
So we have a lot of error correction problems and stuff that slows things down. It's a generalization of probability. So you might want to run that calculation again, maybe again, maybe a billion times. You're going to run the calculation with sensitivity analysis, fiddling with stuff to where can I trust this value that got produced? And you're, you're still going to have to sequence for the setting up to trigger the wave function collapse. You know, you've got to address the hardware in some logical way. And, um, you know, if you're on a classical system, this is just time shifting what you have to do anyway. It's a lazy compute. You still have to do the compute. Now, if it's quantum hardware, you're offloading the compute to another dimension. If you're in this dimension, you're just time shifting it like Haskell does. So it's not infinitely fast, but some things it can be way, way faster, depending on how much of this you need to fiddle with. Time. So the the early days of you know, quantum jump nonsense with the, max, you know, the, the, the Planck constant, you know, that, that kind of made people nervous. And especially as you drill down and you know, funny things, spooky action dis distance, all that stuff. But time is kind of an interesting thing. And we totally kicked software developers. Planet Earth, multi-core, multi-processing, we kicked time's butt. But everybody else 100 years ago, they did not yet do that. And they were nervous. So quantum mechanics, if it hasn't shocked you, you don't really understand it yet. It's weird and it's out of order, but we're like, you know, Doctor Who and Star Trek people. We totally know what's going on. Like all the TV shows are telling us. And is it different from that? No, no, it's exactly just that. Time doesn't exist. It's not real. It is imaginary in the mathematical sense, but in reality, it does not exist. It really does not exist. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm, uh, you know, I had lunch and then I, you know, th we have this serialization of correlation that, we, that we're kind of mentally modeling. It sure looks real to me. Well, yeah, but I mean, before you saw bacteria, that wasn't real. Before you saw viruses, that wasn't real. You know, lots of things weren't real until you could measure it. Oh, we can totally measure this stuff. We can build time crystals now. This is cool. Time is imaginary in the mathematical sense. And it's also not real in the physical sense. But timeline discontinuities, they can and do occur. And it's weird because, shoot, we can trigger these things all the freaking time. And especially when you're playing around with hardware, quantum hardware, we can start messing with timeline discontinuities for real, no joke, not kidding. So time, well, time's not real, so what is it? Well, well actually, time's a technology. Well, what's technology? Well, you know, it's sort of this, it's this useful framework. It's like a, it's a technological construct. You know, it, it's a model by which I'm going to sort of describe things and consistent with this model, I'm going to use that as a tool to predict things or structure things or maintain invariance. And well, you know, that sounds like a very useful tool. Oh, it is. It's like most people use time a lot. So if time's a technology, well, what's implied? We're going to use it as a tool because it's technology. But what's it, well, all technologies can be manipulated and bypassed. And we can do that with time. And, and we software, we're actually very familiar with this already. We do this all the time, especially on multi-core. The quantum universe, it doesn't actually care about time, doesn't use time, time's not relevant for it. So all these quantum effects things, you know, we start seeing effect precedes cause kind of things all the time because they see it in like sci-fi plots for the movie or the Star Trek episode. Well, reality's that way too. It's weird for us to process, maybe we are uncomfortable with it, but that's the natural world. It works like that. But that's, that's only our perception is at issue. The land of physics, no problem. But we do this time as a technology thing really, really well. It's because everything has a beginning and a middle and an end. And C++ is really, really good at this. Time is a technology for sequencing beginning, middle, and end. Now, now we all kind of know time is not absolute. There's no absolute epic, theory of relativity. We all kind of know that stuff nowadays. But this sequencing of beginning, middle, and end, you know, that kind of is important, especially when we went multi-core and many-core, because now I have threads and I have to like sequence sensibly what's going across them for concurrent access to state. And we use tools and approaches for threading. Turns out that, that that's time. Time is a metric, but we are going across clocks and threads and resources, and we are sequencing a sensible access when, in fact, the threads themselves are not absolute on the same clock, they don't need to be, and they're not absolute on the same period, they don't need to be. And they're not, in reality, especially in distributed computing. We, we, we totally do this all the time. 
So modeling the quantum life cycle, now that's really important because we're going to do the setup and tear down. You set up your threads, you tear them down. You set up your objects, you tear them down. You set up your processes, tear them down. Set up your nodes, tear them down. You can do whatever you want and set up and tear down. But somehow the beginning and middle and end has to be sequenced sensibly across the whole system. And we totally do this because we got this REI thing and time is a technology. So here we go. Process A. Beginning, end. There's a clock. It ran that long. Ideally, we know that's not true. So, well, well, what's interfering with us? Well, you know, you kind of got this setup time and this shutdown time, you know. There's sort of some coordination maybe happening at the kernel or the OS level. And maybe sometime in there, you're trying to wait on some system resource. So it's going to insert this, this bubble or yield or, or some kind of hole into your process by which you're, you're waiting, you're suspended. And so now, now we start talking about these other clocks. Well, you know, I had the ideal clock, but now I have a user clock and I have a system clock. Huh, weird, okay, more clocks. We're totally cool with that. This is like, since 2004, this is like everybody's doing this all the time. Well, we can context swap and get suspended in and out, and we can do other coordination with other things, and these other bubbles get inserted. And a lot of times those bubbles aren't even things our process triggered. So we have a variable duration for our given process that's not our fault. There's something else going on that is causing pressure on, on the cache or the hardware or the resources or the system or whatever. And now this, this wall clock starts to show up. So look at all these clocks. We're totally cool with that. We're good with this now. And well, we're not done. I mean, the processors throttle their own clock, like on the fly. I'm hot. I'm cold. I want to warm up. I'm going to cool. Let's kick in some more threads. And now there's absolutely nothing guaranteed here. Things are moving along all the time. But the takeaway is duration is absolute. And this is why micro benchmarking is so hard because you got like all this interference. And maybe you did the system call, but that's about it. Everything else is outside your control. So wall clock can be less than CPU clock. That's weird. But we now know, well, that's because things ran in parallel. No, I ran it single-threaded. Well, yeah, you ran it single-threaded, but it ran you know, multiple instructions parallel you know, while you ran, so the CPU can do weird things. So we're totally comfortable with this. Duration is not fixed. In the land of physics, it's not fixed, but we know it's not fixed. So absolute measure. We, we do have this you know, general special relativity thing going on, but we can reset the system clock like whenever we want. You can reset it and run our process. There it is. Well, we can like reset it halfway through the process, or we can suspend the process or like hibernate the laptop or something. So we can start to introduce these discontinuities before or during the process run. And if you have multiple processes that don't share an epoch, they have no shared concept of time. But we actually do have techniques and ways of ordering logically beginning, middle, and end across processes that are running at the same time or not running at the same time. We, we know how to do this. And then, of course, this is Groundhog Day. I want to run the process, and I'll just reset the epic every time. So you know, this is the first time you ran Groundhog Day. This is the first time you ran Groundhog Day. This is the first thing. You, know, you can repeat Groundhog Day as much as you want. So the, the duration is not fixed, but the epic is also not fixed. Everything, everything's kind of relative, and, and we deal with this. We have techniques for this. This is, this is not unfamiliar to us. So it, it, time is actually closer to a movie reel. You know, there's the movie reel, and, and you know, we, there, there's kind of this logical comfort level of sequencing in an ordered fashion, zero to n frames. You know, that, that's kind of the movie. You don't want to ruin the ending, so watch it in order. But random access is totally doable. So random accessing your frames is, is basically you playing with time as your technology, time as your mechanism to assess things in the past and future. And we do this. We have a lot of systems where they take control of the clock so they can replay scenarios or somehow control some environment independent of other clocks. So you can insert this little time bubble on your process around all the other processes which exist in a different time bubble because time is technology. Totally good on this. Looks a lot like a Turing machine when you play a movie back through a projector. And that's neat, but you can start leveraging that. I'll invoke the observer effect, you know, 60 frames a second or 30 frames a second or whatever it is because random access is possible, but we're used to sequential access, but we're familiar with random access and we set up our data structures to allow that. This is really cool, so I had to put it in there. It's a piece of plastic, it's just 3D printed and it's sitting there, but as you spin it at a certain phase, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the jumping frog. The animation is way cool. So, so go look at that, but that would be another approximation. 
The frogs aren't jumping. It's a phased observation. You, the observer, are conveying a construct onto the illusion of time progression. There is no time progression. You, the observer, are adding the context of the time progression. The universe does this, which is weird, makes people nervous. There is a mathematical basis to talk about this. It's consistent, it's predictive, and it's useful. And we have tech that's doing things like that, time being mathematically imaginary and not real, being a technology, effects precede cause. A lot of TV shows talking about it, so I don't need to, but mass is an effect, not a cause. True mass doesn't exist. Time is an effect, not a cause. So we, we use those, they're interesting, we need to serialize sense in our lives, but time is just a mechanism we're using. It's a technology which we can play with and manipulate. So, um, you know, there, there's, a, there, there's a lot of confusion in this world, there's not agreement, you know, I have to say that of course, but uh, the future sends an offer wave and you select through the observer effect your navigation of the offer wave. So the future is collaborating with the present to build a future. Well, the present is collaborating with the past to build a future. And you wanna believe that's not true? Just watch Doctor Who, it works just like that. <laughs> and, and you know, it's funny, except that's not a joke. The quantum data structure, okay. So we played around time, that's kind of fun, but it's based on this interference thing. So nature, nature by the land of physics, there is a very strange rule, and this is a real rule. This happens. An object behaves, different, behaves differently when it is not being measured, measured meaning observed, when it's not being observed. When you're not looking at the toys in the bedroom, they run around like Toy Story. That, that's what this is saying. And uh, in the land of physics, that's actually true. And at the micro scale, that's true, but it turns out with technology, you can do that at the macro scale, which is interesting. But a quantum object, data object, even in our classical systems, a quantum object exists with a portion of its life cycle that's not measured. You're gonna set it up, you're gonna fiddle with it, you may entangle more things, but you're not measuring it. You didn't look at it. Once you look at it, you wave function collapse, you've got, you've got a certain value. But prior to that, you're setting up, you've orchestrated the algorithm by which the eventual measure will be presented. So quantum data objects and the natural world, they all sit on this. But in the life cycle of our data objects, a quantum data object would be one that you create, it's going to exist in an eigenvalue for a while, then you will observe it, and then it'll exist in an eigenstate, and then you're either gonna destroy it or you're gonna maybe entangle it again. That's, that's the life cycle of a quantum object. And, and this is an interesting thing. In, information leakage is a, is a big topic by itself. You don't actually have to have particles interacting for it, but you know, let's see here and there. Attributes of a quantum data structure. So if you want to build one, because they're fun. They have state, even if the state's implied, right? Even an empty object has state at size of one and you know, exists somewhere. And you, know, you don't have to make that. You can have it movable only, but... Um, there's state, but ultimately the idea of that object is the idea of what you're entangling. That's the state you have, and maybe there's a bit payload, maybe there's a resolution, maybe there are rules that you've established on the payload. But it's gonna transition atomically, transactionally atomically through quantum jumps. And you're not gonna have this, you, you can have whole regions where it's an eigenvalue, you have whole regions where it's undefined too, you can do whatever you want, but when it goes to the observer effect, it's gonna be a transactional atomic value that is yielded. So you can't inspect the intermediate state, but you do get your value out once you trigger the wave function collapse. And now you get into this um, high coupling, high complexity problem because when I decohere, it's a, it's a mutating read. When I decohere, I'm gonna go decohere everybody to which I'm entangled. Because if they were entangled with me and I went certain, then they have to go certain too. They, they can't just be dropped. They, they're entangled with me and my value is set, it's locked, it's certain. That information is now leaked into those other objects and they have to trigger a collapse. And they will have a probability of likelihood of being correct, you know, up or down based on something. I will have one too. But that's the quantum computation that physically uh, uh, occurs in nature. And that's what will model in our software system if we're trying to model nature. So, this type safety gets really, really undermined. You're not just entangling a bull with a bull. You're gonna entangle a bull with a date, 
a date with a chair, a box with a cat with a chair, with a date with a bull. You're going to entangle arbitrarily across types, because actually that's going to be the most useful entanglements. It's possible you want to just entangle a bunch of ints. That's fine. But most of the user usable, interesting algorithms, you're entangling across types. So that's going to totally undermine your type safety. You'll always have a discrete value once you look, but it's going to way undermine your type safety. The computational density goes way up. So that, that's a concern if you want to go into this world. But interference is in achieved through entanglement. And an object, and this is kind of weird, uh, but you know, there, are a lot of there have been talks here at this conference about an object being entangled with its future self. You know, here's my clock, and I can play the object forward and backward in time, because it's got its own linked list history of mutations, like Haskell, right? Read-only data structures. Well, my value is this, which is my previous value plus this mutation. And then you got this huge linked list node of things, and you can play that object forward and backward in time arbitrarily. That's this. That, that's just this. We have techniques for this now. So it, it's interesting, but that's a, a higher computational density inside a data object that knows its position in time. Literally, you've described the wave function for that object, and that object is entangled with its future self and past self. That's allowed. You can do it across types. You can do it with yourself. So um, there can be some tools and type safety things that compilers can give us with that, but that's a concern. It's, it, you know, it's computational density. Using it, okay, the API. If you're going to use these things, your API, they're going, to, they're going to present more or less reads, and internally, they're going to be transactionally atomic mutation reads. So they're actually very, very easy to use. Atomic data structures are like super easy. Did you look at it? Yes. Okay, well, it is what it is. You're done. So using it is very easy. Authoring it is complicated. So. Your API will allow for mutations, and you know, modeling the mutations classically on classical hardware is hard. Quantum hardware is maybe easier, certainly doable. I mean, other languages, Haskell, all the read-only languages are kind of doing this already. And it's helpful if your API would please let you distinguish, I'm not reading you, but if I were to read you, would that now trigger a wave function collapse? Like, like are you already pinned to an eigenstate? Because if he's pinned to the eigenstate, you can go ahead and read it. It's not going to be destructive. But if it's an eigenvalue, it'd be nice to be able to kind of test, you know, if I were to read you, would this trigger a collapse? That would be a helpful API thing, because we really need to know where in the life cycle the object happens to be. But the algorithms, uh, you can still do matrix math, right? Matrix math, it's like, I got a lot of operands, I got another lot of operands. I'm going to do something very complicated, discard all the operands, and I yielded a result. Well, that, that's a functional operation. You still author functional operations as the mechanisms by which you mutate your state. It's just that it's always going to prese be presented as a transactionally atomic mutation. So stateless functional is fine, but that's an implementation detail because the API will just let you read. These algorithms totally work great with quantum. And, and this is stuff we use. This is kind of like common convention. Lazy compute, factory, future promise, pimple, dynamic CTOR. You know, all this is like well-known patterns that we do now. Totally works great if you had quantum hardware. This would be just fine. Familiar and common. There might be some new data structures, but they're not really that new, because this is basically how we work now. Functionally quantum, maybe every observation of the system clock might yield me a unique value, but I still want it marching forward. Every observation of the random number generator might yield me a unique value, but I want to march forward. And you know, oh, we, we kind of have that now. You know, sort of this um, sticky quantum, really that's like double buffering or triple buffering, where you know, I kind of want to pin a value, but I still want it to still be entangled with all the other things to update the sprite motion on the screen. So this is like, you know, what we're doing now. These aren't really very new things. This is not surprising. It's consistent with existing practice, and, you know, it might be useful. Mostly, it seems to be useful in highly complex domains by which you're willing to handle the increased complexity of the implementation of the object because the computational density goes high. Key observations. Same. It's what we do now. It's like, no big deal. We already deal with, you know, little units of discrete value. Sequencing is in the data structure. Your read is a destructive lazy compute, which means you're not authoring an algorithm with fences and stuff and then triggering the mutation. The mutation and the sequencing of the mutation, that is internal 
to the object. It's internal to the destructive read. So you're gonna move all your sequencing into the object. That's, that's ultimately going to be required because I at a moment's notice, I'm gonna go decohere those other guys to which I am entangled. And you know, they don't exist within some higher algorithm that's running. Their state is manipulated directly by me who's triggering the wave function collapse. So the coupling complexity is significantly higher but you're moving the sequencing into the object. So this is kind of a, a trade-off where we've increased the complexity of the object, but actually we've decreased the complexity of the algorithm because there's no sequencing in the algorithm at all because it's internal to the object. So similar, um, it's kind of like no big deal. This just says this is existing practice. We're gonna know how to do this. Eigenstates, eigenvalues, that might be a useful term to know where in the life cycle your object happens to be, but this is, this is what we're doing now. You can take the slides home, we're running out of time. So quantum is how everything works. Everything's quantum, everything's discrete values, the natural world, our software, everything. We can design data structures for that. Computational density goes up. It's current practice. Ranges are composed of discrete values, but we get to define the rules. We get to define how things get quantized because we're software. We have all the power. This is different for quantum hardware. If you had quantum hardware, it's not entirely like this. It's like this. <laughs> if you are writing C++ for quantum hardware, it's kind of like const expert lock-free programming. They're both tedious, they're both annoying, they both are putting you at odds with the compiler or the hardware or both, and in the end, it's closer to circuit design if you're on quantum hardware. So this is what's going on. If you're on quantum hardware, we already have traces and fabs and circuit diagrams and referential integrity amongst components on a circuit, and we, we define it, it goes to fab, and it is. It just is. Writing, authoring quantum algorithms are closer to that. Of course, the early computers were like that too, but that's today's quantum algorithms. If you're writing software, it's actually closer to circuit design because the sequencing is fixed. You're gonna manipulate and move and run stuff through the circuit, but you can't look at it. There's no conditional branching. There's no extra context by which you can classify values at runtime. That's the land of software. We love conditional processing. Hardware doesn't do that. There is a drum and they run through the circuit and they have to go do the same thing every time. You can have branches in there, but there are hardware ways to approach that. That's what your software is going to have to do. So the fixed runtime static nature of hardware is closer to what today's quantum algorithms would look like. And they go through, of course, through quantum jumps. Sequencing. Classically, we sequence in the algorithm. Quantum sequencing is through the data object. The sequencing is moved internal. Every object takes control of its transactional atomic quantum jump. So software is sort of this imperative execution. Hardware is sort of doing this circuit diagram thing where it just runs with some clock doing some thing. And that circuit design is closer to software for quantum hardware today. And you can't inspect the value. You can't conditionally process the value. You can't runtime classify or do branches. No, no, no. Once you pin it, you pin it, you measure it, you're done. So your approach is different. Computational density goes up. So we can emulate it. Um, functional, these are opposite. Quantum, everything you do quantum is once you observe, boom, mutation. Functional says no mutation because I want to reason about what's going on. You should be able to repeat this, which you can in functional. Quantum, you cannot. That's why it's hard to build hardware. It's hard to address these things, but you know, we're kind of working through it. So quantum data structure seizes control of the sequencing. So final thoughts, got a couple slides here and I think they're useful. It is fringe science, quantum, hardware, quantum science is fringe science. There's a solid basis here. Stuff is going on. We know this, we can measure this, we can use it, we can produce commercial products on it, but it's hard to measure, hard to test, and the darndest things creep into your system. So it's an undeveloped field and that's why it's fringe. It's not deterministic. Your values coming out are not deterministic, but everything around the manufacturing science and the theory is also not matured to that point. But software, we totally have it easy because this is what we do. You know, we deal with epsilon, we deal with quantization, we already know how to deal with time and threads and sequencing across objects. The notation is really important, terminology is important, but you know, we in C++, we're pretty good at that. So we might have to change a couple things, but for the most part, we're pretty good at this as long as you know, don't touch it until you're ready to use it. So notation and terminology, pretty important. Eigenstate, eigenvalue, yeah, okay, the physics guys did that, maybe we should just use their terms. And 
The sequencing, we've got to be careful with, we're using the state, we're productively employing the state, can't look at it. Don't look at it until you trigger the wave function collapse, that essence of mutation, that essence of measurement. And in this bottom one, conventions, this is nothing new. What's your state? How do you want to entangle it? How do you want to do your create, destroy life cycle, your source sync life? That is nothing new, especially C++. We have, we have constructors and destructors. These are our patterns. But man, you cannot do this quantum thing without those patterns. Those go to the top of the list as what's really important in your design. So if you want to go do the quantum data structure thing, C++ is a really useful language because these are really fundamental essential capabilities of modeling sense. And the hardware guys, they actually have it hard because they're trying to discover weird things. And there's a lot of hardware, a lot of money, and a lot of different approaches to measuring these little waveform interactions that are around you everywhere, lots of ways to do that. And then we got dev kits dropping from you know, D-Wave and Microsoft, and you know, everybody's trying to kind of explore this space with different approaches, hoping somebody hits gold. And you know, to varying extents, we have. Thank you for coming. This stuff is so cool. So yeah, any questions on anything?